What's up, YouTube? I don't know how to start most of my videos. I don't have like a catchphrase. Catchphrase. I don't have a catchphrase. I don't have a catchphrase. I guess that's a little Australian. It's so dumb. Anyway, so today's video is kind of gonna be for people who are uh, thinking about recording a live record. For example, you might be a church uh, worship leader who wants to record a live record but has no idea where to start. So start here. So where does the process begin for live records? Or any recording, really. It starts with a song. So literally the first step in the process, if you're like, I want to record a live record, where do I start? You start with the, the song, like, or songs that you want to do. And typically for people, um, they'll write a song and want to record that song. And that's great, but um, a lot of the people who are releasing music, and, and specifically worship music, I think um, I'm tailoring a lot of what I'm saying to worship uh, music, but it can go for other genres as well. But a lot of times writers will write dozens uh, of songs and then choose maybe one or two of those to bring to the table for a project. And maybe even then they're not accepted uh, because there are other songs that other people are pitching for, for things. So it's like, it's not like you write a song and record it one for one. Uh, that's not usually how it works. You don't have to write dozens of songs to record one or two, uh, but I would suggest write more than one. Maybe write three or four, maybe five songs, uh, and say which one of these is the best representative of what we want to record. And as a producer, I'll go through whatever song is chosen and really line by line go through and say, is this the right line? And chord by chord, is this the right thing that sits underneath it that should? Or should there be a different chord to bring in a different mood or texture or whatever? So really it begins with a song. And then from the song, uh, you enter into a stage of maybe pre-production. And pre-production is, uh, is kind of a mysterious word. Both pre and post-production can be anything that people want them to be. Uh, so if you hear the word pre-production, it might mean something different for somebody else. But... For me, what that looks like is mapping out the song from from beginning to end, like knowing exactly where you're going. Here are the chords, here's the melody, and building a basic skeleton demo of what that song sounds like so that uh, the musicians at your church or in your band can listen to um, the song in its, in its skeleton form and kind of start building upon that. And so with that pre-production demo, a lot of times, I'll throw in suggestions for lead lines on guitar or bass or drum fills or something like that. But it's really like the most basic form of the song so that whatever musician hears it at the church or in the band can say, oh, I really like that. That gives me inspiration to do this. And so they can start building their parts off of that. So after the pre-production demos are made and it's in the musician's hands, typically I'll communicate with a church audio guy or the worship leader uh, or band music director or whatever and gather a list of inputs that the band will be recording that night. And so the input list is really helpful for me to understand what uh, we're recording that night and what might be lacking uh, or what might be uh, overly abundant, like if there are four keys players. Uh, we can split up parts and tones between different different players. Um, and so even arranging what people are going to be playing uh, will be happening in that sort of pre-production, uh, even after the pre-production demos are created. So leading up to the recording, I love having everybody feel comfortable with their parts, where the songs are going, so that uh, they're not having to think too much during the actual recording. They can just concentrate on having fun. And something I didn't realize until later in my career is that live recordings really have a lot of studio elements that are added to them. So really the live night, you want to capture the audience and the drums. Uh, and that's really the essential parts. Uh, if you can get a great drum take and the audience singing along, uh, everything else can be replaced fairly easily. Uh, obviously it's not ideal to have to go back and re-record everything, but at that point, really you can. Um, 
and I've, I, I've had to go back sometimes and overdub everything. It's generally uh, not spoken about. Like, people don't go and say, this is our live record. We did 90% of it in studio. But realistically, that's, that's what you need to do to make it sound uh, perfect, is you need to go back in and overdub your vocals. Because vocalists, you know, like, the end of a set, there, sometimes it's like your voice is strained and you can't, like, sing those notes exactly how you want them to sound, or your voice might crack a little bit, or you might not reach that note. So it's like uh, some of those things are, are just caught in post-production. All right, so on our timeline, song is great. Then we move to pre-production. We get the pre-production demo. The band feels great about playing it. We go to the live recording night, have the input list. We, we know what's being recorded. Everyone's comfortable with their parts. Uh, then we record the night. And then after that, there might be some overdubs. I'll kind of listen through uh, the night and kind of start taking notes as to what might need to be re-recorded. Um, typically, that that's always vocal. I always say, like, we'll probably redo vocal, unless it was some, some magic take live. Um, but yeah, vocals redone. Uh, a lot of times, guitar lead lines, just so they're clean. Um, but... It, it just depends on the projects, so and not all projects requ require a ton of overdubs, but most of them do. Then after all the overdubs are captured and I have all the pieces that I want there, uh, I'll typically add a couple of different things with like programming, uh, percussion, and synth stuff, and uh, especially synth bass to add like a lower end layer across the whole thing for the mixing process. Uh, and then I edit it. Editing is a huge time commitment. Um, basically, you're going through every little piece of what was recorded, oftentimes 150, 200 tracks, if not more, um, and you're aligning everything and making sure things are, are meshing together. Uh, you're time aligning it, you're tuning it. Um, yeah, there's so much that goes into editing and uh, just takes a lot of time, especially on live recording since uh, there's a lot of energy in the room and some people have the tendency to rush and some people have the tendency to like not think about what they're playing exactly. So taking what's live take and overdub take and creating, you know, comps between those two or uh, just scrapping the live and just doing, you know, studio thing. But even in the studio, you can get a take really, really great um, and it still doesn't line up perfectly. Uh, so... I love it to, to breathe and have some human <laughs> feeling to it, but at the same time, uh, you don't want there to be too much error uh, in what you have that you're, you're releasing, so. And then comes the mixing. So mixing and mastering is kind of this weird world where uh, a lot of people don't understand what the difference between editing and producing and mixing and mastering are, which I don't, I don't blame you. I mean, you can talk to 10 different producers and get 10 different answers for what producing is like what what is producing music so um just to understand a little bit about mixing and mastering uh, and editing so editing for me is kind of getting all the ingredients in a row and organizing organizing them uh and making sure they're they're right so like just like in cooking if you have you know a tablespoon of salt and a, a teaspoon of pepper you would measure those out make sure they're the right uh, measurements and get them set aside to be uh, used later. So it's kind of like the editing process. You make sure everything's in a row and make sure everything's lined up and tuned up right. Uh, and then the mixing process is uh, I typically send my mixes out to friends to mix for me because I like mixing, but at the same time, I'm kind of like, there's just so much that goes into mixing with uh, different hardware and different software um, different samples that I like to get the, the pieces together, edit them, but I like somebody else to be the one to mix it. So if I'm producing and I'm editing, uh, typically my, my, uh, preference is to send to somebody else. So they'll mix it all together. They'll do all the, the magic of mixing. And then mastering is almost like putting what's been mixed together into the oven. So if you're, you know, baking brownies or uh, cookies or something, uh, 
you kind of get all the flavors mixed together. You know what it, it kind of looks like, but you finish it off uh, in the oven. And so mastering really brings things to the proper level uh, so that, you know, on Spotify, if they go from one song to yours, it's not like a crazy volume difference. And um, yeah, there, I mean, there's, there's different things with mixing and mastering. They use similar tools like compression and EQ. So it's, it's a little confusing until you really dive into it, but I would think about it in terms of like mixing and baking, uh, mixing and mastering. So once a mix or a master is sent to you, uh, my friend Josh does a lot of my mixing and mastering for me. So he'll just send me masters. So once I get a mix back from Josh uh, or a master, I'll, I'll usually send that to um, the artist or church. They'll listen to it, give their mix revisions and go back and forth a couple times. Uh, then yeah, they'll have the master and they'll have it ready to release. But the process is different for everybody. I know that different churches and different artists do things differently. So um, this process might not be the exact thing that happens for you, um, but it is a kind of a general overview that there's, you know, starting with a song, you you choose, you go into pre-production and then you record it. And then there's post-production where you do editing and mixing and mastering, and then you've got the final product. So that's the basic timeline of recording, uh, like a live record. When you're usually in the studio tracking, there's there's a lot less pre-production um, that, that goes on for studio records because um, you're actually in the studio uh, with a song and um, pre-production looks more like setting up a session and making sure all the instruments are, are patched in and uh, labeled correctly so that when you're recording, uh, you know where things are at. Uh, that's another big thing if you're if you're looking at doing doing stuff like this organization in your files and as you label things, those are, those are pretty big deals. So, I mean, if you have like 150 tracks and none of them are labeled and they're all automatically like audio one, audio two, audio three, I mean, it's, it's really difficult to find what's there. It's just way easier on the front end to do that stuff. So uh, whether it's in the studio or live, organization is a pretty big part of that. So yeah, now you know where to start. Uh, you start with the song, and if you're looking for songs or looking to write songs, um, I do hold. Uh, they're they're free. They're not. They don't cost anything. Just, I don't. I'm not pushing anything onto you. Um, but I do songwriting retreats for churches and worship artists. If your church or you are looking to do a worship project, hit me up. I can help from the beginning to the end. Uh, the information will be in the description below, or you can email me, jessedeanrivero at gmail.com. So, thanks for having me. I was ending the video and I realized I didn't let you guys know about any of the projects that I have been working on. So, uh, check out the Watch Worship. I don't, I don't know why I'm pointing there. Maybe I'm gonna edit something there later, I don't know. Check out the Watch Worship, did their live record. It released earlier this year, and I loved working on it. Uh, everything from writing the songs with the guys, um, to recording, to praying with them, to the release. Uh, went to Lynchburg to celebrate the release with them. Uh, the party was canceled, but we still got dinner, so. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, the Watch Worship is great. Uh, check out Kelly and Kristen, Delight in You, just released. Uh, we've got a couple more that's that are coming. Uh, but yeah, Delight in You is out. That was recorded at Liberty University in their School of Music building. It's, it's pretty sweet. Um, uh, Sky Natives, my band, I don't really do too much uh, with it, but we released a song this year uh, called You Mean the World. Uh, so check that out as well. Um, I'm about to start work on uh, a project for my friend Ricky. Uh, so I'll update you guys on that. Maybe I'll take the camera around and um, do more content so I can show you guys kind of what it looks like uh, from the beginning to the end of that process. We're about to start the song selection process. So that'll be fun. Uh, and I'm trying to think of what else. I'll just, how about this? Follow me on Instagram 
I'll post things there. Uh, my new Instagram, unfortunately, Facebook deleted my Facebook and Instagram, so had to start new ones. Long story, maybe I'll do a video on that later, but uh, my new Instagram is at the Jesse Phillips. Uh, it, was, it was available, I took it, so you'll see more of my projects there. Anyway, thanks for watching. I appreciate you watching up until this point. So I think there's like 20 seconds where th like videos will pop up on the screen uh, that are suggested for you from my channel. Uh, so feel free to watch other content from my channel. Um, and I'll catch you later. This is a root beer, by the way.